Hello and welcome back to another lecture on my channel Iron Francis. In this lecture, we will discuss the critical essay titled Language of Paradox by Cleanth Brooks. Cleanth Brooks was one of the 20th century American critics who belonged to the New Criticism Movement. The new critics of the 20th century, such as Cleanth Brooks, I.A. Richards, William Emson and so on, they believed that the meaning of a literary work should not be sought out from the sources which are outside the text, such as the historical background in which the text was written, or the author's intention while writing the text, or what the readers felt while reading the text. All these are not necessary. When a text is studied, we only have to focus on the text. They focused on close reading. That is, meaning can be taken out from what is there inside the text. You don't have to go for information outside. So for this, new critics started to focus on certain literary devices, literary aspects of these works. For example, William Emson talks about ambiguity and Cleon Brooks talk about paradox in this essay. So this essay was basically a part of a collection titled The well Wrought Urn which was published in 1947. There were a total of 11 essays in this work and the first chapter was titled Language of Paradox. And as I mentioned, Brooks was one of the new critics and this work focuses on new criticism. We can simplify the whole essay into majorly two points. Firstly, since we are not going for the meaning of a work from outside the text, there should be something inside the text. Cleanth Brooks believes that we are supposed to learn or look into the paradoxes in the text, in the poem, in order to understand the poem better. Secondly, he also differentiates between the language of science and language of poetry. A paradox is simply a self-contradictory statement. That is, two opposite ideas are put together in the same sentence. Look at these examples. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Now, if all animals are equal, how can some be more equal? That is self-contradictory in itself. Death, those shall die. How do you expect death to die? The third one is child is the father of a man. If the child is a child, how can it be a father of a man? So, these are all self-contradictory, but even though it is contradictory, there is a meaning in it. So such statements which make us think because of the differences is called a paradox. It could be a statement, it could also be a situation. Now let's try to understand the points of the essay. Cleanth Brooks begins his essay directly by talking about paradox. He says that paradox is the language of sophistry, hard, bright, witty. It is hardly the language of the soul. Now, we would expect Cleanth Brooks to say that paradox is something that is supposed to be very much in relation with poetry, uh, very much that is emotional. But he says that it is very sophisticated, it's very hard, uh, it's very bright, only for the brilliant people, the witty people. You wouldn't expect it to be the language of soul or the language of poetry or art. And he also says, we regard paradox as an intellectual element rather than emotional clear rather than profound, rational rather than irrational. So paradox doesn't seem to fit at all with poetry. Now, Cleon Brooks tells us, see, this is the preconceived notion we have about the using of a paradox. We think that paradox cannot show emotion, it is not the language of the soul, it is very sophisticated, it is very hard, so we are not willing to use paradox in poetry. But then Cleon Brooks says, language of poetry is the language of paradox. Now please note that this is the sentence with which Brooks begins his essay. That is, language of poetry is the language of paradox. I have rearranged it a bit to make you think about what he is telling us. Okay, so Brooks says that paradox is the language which is appropriate. It not only suits poetry, but it is also inevitable. You cannot take out paradox from poetry. And Brooks tells us that when you are talking about science, you can't simply put in a lot of paradox. 
you have to state the facts as it is you can't simply put in uh, contradictory uh, statements contradictory ideas in a statement and make it confusing when you're talking about science but when it is poetry and art paradox is inevitable now poets require something that is more than language to show the message to convey their message so thus paradox is inevitable in poetry and he doesn't stop there he wants to prove his point so he gives us certain examples in these examples we find that he mainly discusses poems of william wordsworth and the poem canonization by john donne paradoxes in these Wordsworth as we know is one of the romantic poets Wordsworth and Coleridge has insisted on writing poems that are very simple focus on the common everyday life and so on so even though he insisted on simplicity now uh, Cleanth Brooks is telling that his poems are based on paradoxical situations let's see the first poem is Wordsworth's sonnet titled Combos upon Westminster Bridge He talks about the beauty of London in the poem and even though London is a man-made city he talks about it as if it is something naturally occurring it has been there naturally so this is a paradox even though it is man-made it is artificial he is talking about it as if it is a natural landscape another example again wordsworth sonnet titled it is a beauteous evening calm and free Now in the sonnet you can find that the poet describes the evening with certain words like calm quiet breathless and so on but the problem is that if the evening is very calm then how can it be breathless so such contradictory ideas are being put into the uh, poem in the lines again clean brooks notices that the speaker in the beginning of the poem thinks that he has a woman with him and he thinks that even though the speaker is being a worshipper of nature he is admiring nature and its beauty the woman beside him doesn't seem to be a worshipper of nature at all but towards the end of the poem we understand that his female companion is more full of worship than him because from the beginning of the poem the speaker has been admiring nature but he has been admiring nature only at that particular moment when he saw something beautiful but we understand at the end of the poem that this woman is a person who has been admiring nature every single day of her life so who is the better worshipper it definitely has to be the female companion but this is revealed to us by the use of a paradox it's not only the poems of the romantic period but he also quotes poems from the neoclassical period especially the poem essay on man by alexander pope now moving forward we have john dunn's poem canonization which has been very elegantly described in his essay but the major point that he discusses is again the paradox used in the poem that is even though the love between the speaker and his beloved is physical and worldly they talk about it as if it is very divine which is a paradox so poet is treating worldly love as divine love and towards the end of the poem we realize that these uh, lovers they understand that they have not lost the world because they have gained each other's worlds in each other's eyes or in each other themselves so it's like even though they claim to be unworldly they have become the most worldly of all so that is a paradox now a similar paradox is uh, seen in shakespeare's romeo and juliet where the lovers we have this paradox wherein they seem to be canonized but their love is also very worldly The last example that I have pointed out here is not actually a poem. Here Cleanth Brooks has pointed out that Coleridge's ideas on creative imagination. He has talked about creative imagination in his Biographia Literaria. And the way he explains this to his readers is by using a series of paradoxes. Okay so these are few examples from Glenn Brooks essays wherein he shows that all the romantic poems the neoclassical poems metaphysical poems called its essays they have been all using paradoxes but why do they have to use paradox and he says paradoxes spring from the very nature of poet's language paradox is part of a poet's language 
a language in which connotations are as important as denotations that is art should always have multiple meanings and paradox will help with that so paradox is actually a trick that poets use in writing poems paradox could be used as a method by which unlikely comparisons things you wouldn't compare normally could be compared can be drawn and meaning can be extracted directly and indirectly there will be a meaning for what is written for the literal meaning and there will be also something that is hidden which we will understand through the paradox and that extra something that the poems get from the paradox will give the poem its dignity its elegance and makes it more interesting so that was our first point and secondly clean brooks talks about the differences between language of science and language of poetry now firstly he says language of science is very direct when you open a science textbook when you open your geography textbook you always expect it to be stating only facts you don't expect paradoxes which will confuse you so science always tries to keep language strictly in control and it sticks to the dictionary meaning if a word is written the meaning will be only that is given in the dictionary there couldn't be any other meaning for science but that is not the case with poetry art can never be direct if there is a poem in which the poet is writing i went outside i saw the sun setting it was beautiful and the poem is done we will never be interested in a poem like that art can never be direct it has to be indirect it has to make us think so the terms in poetry is always modified there should be something devices used in the poem to modify the words to change its meaning to give multiple meanings and it always violates their dictionary meanings you you see the word red and the teacher will tell you in the class red is showing the danger or the emotions in the mind of the speaker so there is always multiple meanings associated with a word it doesn't have to be always the meaning given in the dictionary so that's the difference between language of science and language of art and here again brooks tells us that poet is constructing his own language he defines his own rules the poet is not limited to anything he has countless possibilities with his language so this is only the first chapter of his book the well wrought urn here he discusses paradox he also discusses irony and other devices but uh, this is all that he discusses here and what he is trying to tell us is that we have been used to looking at the background of the author background of the age the period uh, writer and so on that we think that it is the correct way to learn a text so brooks is trying to change this he is giving us uh, certain examples masterpieces to show us that these poems have stood the test of time because they were not written and analyzed only based on certain background information these poets wrote not only for their generation if we had analyzed it like that these poems would have also lost their importance so he stresses on the close reading of a text while analyzing a text a text is enough so with that we conclude this lecture i hope you have understood thank you so much for watching